Hi, my name is Rhonda Wilson. I'm Professor of Nursing here at University of Newcastle and I'm a proud descendant of the Wiradjuri Nation. And tonight I'd like you to join with me and pause for a moment as we offer some respect um, about the country that we're meeting on tonight and wherever you're watching us from tonight. Um, pause with me for a moment and remember the Aboriginal land that you and, and we are treading on tonight. Beneath the concrete, beneath the roads and the tarmacs is Aboriginal land. It has been that way since Dreamtime. I'd also like to ask you to pause to reflect and to offer some respect to the elders, past, present and emerging. And I'd particularly like to offer my respect to uh, the Dakanan Nation where I live and work here at the University of Newcastle. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. And as, as you were speaking, I was also reflecting on the importance of, of connection, particularly at a time like mm. this. And I think that's something we can all learn from, from our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander partners. So thank you for your acknowledgement. Pleasure. And thank you to everybody at home, wherever that home might be, and for the wonderful people in the room here tonight to join us for this second in our series of the Looking Ahead Lectures where we're also taking a minute to pause and reflect on better, healthier living, and particularly the way in which we might be able to care for others, to care for ourselves and to care for our communities anyway, but, but particularly in uh, this time that we find ourselves in. And so thank you for putting aside time in your busy schedules, in all of the things that we do during our day to also stop and reflect um, and join us tonight. And thank you to our wonderful panel who I'll introduce uh, in a moment. But first I thought I might talk a little bit about um, mental health and wellbeing. So that's my background, that's an area of passion for mine. Um, I like to think I have a little bit of expertise, but I guess I'll leave that to the wider community to comment on. My name's Frances K. Lampkin. I'm the Interim Pro Vice-Chancellor here for Research and Innovation at the University of Newcastle. I'm also a very uh, passionate and committed mental health researcher. And so um, my, my colleagues here also have expertise in mental health and alcohol and other drug use um, problems and concerns. And even before we hit, we hit 2020 as a group and as a field, we were quite concerned about the mental health and well-being of the people that we love and also our nation um, and the world in general. And that's particularly uh, for our young people, um, one of four in whom will experience a mental health problem in any 12-month period but very few of whom actually seek treatment and support for the things that are concerning them most. And that's particularly the case for um, some of our young men who really only access mental health care at about 13% um, of, the, at the, of the rate at which um, they might be experiencing mental disorders. Um, but also across the nation, um, mental disorders and substance use and alcohol use disorders is something that are in the hearts and minds of us all. Uh, with almost half of Australians reporting a mental disorder at some stage in our lifetime. So really that means even before 2020 hit us, that our families and basically everybody we know, if not ourselves, is touched by mental disorders um, and their consequences. And particularly um, dear to my heart and of a, of a particular concern to me is that interplay between mental health and substance use disorders, something that we call comorbidity. And there are lots of ways you can describe that. But often people can be using alcohol or other sorts of drugs to help them cope with the symptoms and the experiences that they have. And sometimes it's the mental health concerns that can lead to some of those alcohol and other drug concerns. And when that all gets mixed up together uh, for, for somebody, it really can make um, getting access to treatment that much more difficult and the recovery a little more protracted and a little more complicated. Um, and the reason that that was a concern and that that's a concern even before we hit 2020 is that there is a worldwide shortage of available health professionals who are here and ready and waiting to help people respond to and, and help them cope with their needs for mental health support. 
In Australia, we only have about one psychiatrist per 1,400 people with a mental disorder. And for psychologists who do a, a lot of a different work from psychiatrists, our national average is around 87 psychologists per 100,000 people. So if we have around one in four people in any one year who experience a mental health disorder, that's of a sufficient enough threshold where we would like people to access treatment. We can quickly see that even before COVID hit and 2020 hit, there's a real shortfall in our ability to respond to this demand and this ongoing need. And that's certainly an area that we've all been working in for quite some time and thinking about ways in which we can respond um, to that gap. And then 2020 came upon us. <laughs> I don't know what to say about this year. Um, uh, what we do know already is that we have some early emerging evidence, particularly from that first month of COVID-19, um, with a survey conducted by almost 14,000 Australians that we were seeing at least double the levels of clinically significant depressive um, and anxious symptoms lots of um, people thinking that they'd be better off somewhere else um, and really experiencing irritability, difficulties with concentration and real difficulties going about our day-to-day -day business. Uh, we have one in four people reporting quite moderate symptoms of depression and anxiety. And really, um, so these are new cases, so people who weren't feeling that way before COVID or 2020 hit, but for the most vulnerable people um, in our country and, and particularly those who have pre-existing mental health or substance use problems, they're really feeling the impacts of, of this year as it unfolds. To focus a little bit on alcohol and other drug use, we are also starting to see, and certainly were earlier in the year, increased rates of alcohol consumption, particularly by, by um, us here in Australia. So around a third of Australians were reporting that they were drinking daily, and that's compared to about 6% of people pre-2020 or pre-COVID. And it seems to be particularly tough for parents. So I don't know if parents out there um, are joining us. Um, I'm a parent myself, but really the, the added pressures of, of holding our family together, of the pressures that on, on our economic um, viability as a family and our work, um, and also with homeschooling and, and thinking and trying to create a safe space for our kids um, as we navigate the, 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 um, the anxieties associated with COVID have really um, brought an extra strain on our families. And we're seeing that this is taking its toll in terms of, again, significantly increased alcohol consumption um, by parents as a result of these increased responsibilities. To talk a little bit more about that relationship between parents um, and children, we're really seeing also some very early signs of our young people and some of our very young people just struggling to understand what it is that 2020 has, means for them um, and their world going forward. Um, a work by a group from the University of Melbourne has indicated um, that of this group who were surveyed uh, a little earlier this year, that 81% of children in these families had experienced at least one symptom of trauma um, over the year um, in response to COVID-19. And that can be manifest in a number of ways. So I'm not sure if we've had experiences at home with um, kids with some trouble sleeping alone, or maybe who might be acting a little un bit younger than their, they, they, um, their years or a little bit older than their years. And these are the sorts of signs and symptoms we might be seeing emerge as, as our little people try to understand and cope with, with 2020. The difficult thing in thinking about uh, 2020 and, and particularly COVID and, and what that's brought to bear on us is that um, some of the things that we've um, been required to do um, and that we need to do for the public health can actually have a longer term impact on our mental health and wellbeing. So there are some negative factors associated with being confined at home, um, withdrawing from our usual way of, of connecting with people um, and the fear of infection and the anxiety about what the world might hold um, going forward can really start to exert itself um, on our everyday life. And I guess that's what we might all be feeling as we come into the end um, of 2020 and think about what 2021 and beyond might hold for us. We might be feeling it's a bit harder than usual to concentrate. We might be a bit irritable um, compared to usual. We might be feeling a bit restless and a bit more nervous and, and quite worried about our future. And again, if we've had some mental health problems or some alcohol and other drug use concerns coming into 2020, then we'll be feeling these impacts um, even more strongly and severely. 
Um, and some of the models that uh, we're looking at now um, in, in thinking about what we might need to do to plan ahead um, in the years ahead in response to, to 2020 and COVID-19 suggest to us that the hard work is only just beginning. So for us as mental health carers and providers and, and um, people who um, organise and support those in service roles, we're really only just starting to see some of these impacts trickle through. And we've been talking recently about um, how our, our university and how our health services and how our organisations are leveraging um, and, and mobilising to respond. Because it is the reality, and it will be for quite some time going forward, that we don't have all the facts that we might need. We can't remove all the risks related to COVID-19 um, and we certainly can't promise that we're all going to return to normal or to pre-2020. And in some instances, that might be a good thing. We also can't eliminate all the worry and that underlying anxiety that we're feeling as we think about what might be next, what 2020 might hold in store for us um, uh, um, next and beyond. And really, it's, it's hard to kind of to think about and hold in our minds um, some of the juxtapositions that, we, um, that, that 2020 has thrown at us. So particularly, I'm not sure if any of these are resonating with anybody at home, but kind of the things that, that are at odds or that tension that we might feel between what we need to do under COVID-19 conditions and what we might naturally think we need to do um, if COVID wasn't around. And so some examples where we're used to experiencing and thinking about hospitals and health services as places to go to get help when we need it most, but actually we can't go there when we've needed it most because of fears around infection and transmission for COVID-19. Um, some stores are closed, yet some are open. What does that mean? Um, everybody needs to stay home, but it's important to go out and get exercise. Um, you can walk around with a friend at some in some cases, but not with your family if they don't live under the same roof. So all of these almost Jekyll and Hyde type considerations that have been upon us um, through 2020 and might continue with us um, for quite some time have really led and, and, and increased this sense of what we call cognitive dissonance. So that real, as I said, Jekyll and Hyde between trying to reconcile almost opposing views or ideas about the way in which our world might work. And that can create even more anxiety, some irritability, some loss for that life we had and a life that might have been easier before 2020 hit us and lots of worry about what all that um, brings to bear. And if nothing else, it's just a very uncomfortable situation for our human mind to endure. And I think that we'll be in this state for, uh, for a little while longer as we emerge from that first wave of COVID-19. So I think maybe that's resonated with people at home. It certainly is, is, has been my experience and the experiences of our panel here so far in reflecting on 2020. But what can we do about this? Um, we want to do talk about and acknowledge those experiences, but we'd also like people to think about, about hope and optimism and resilience in the face of what is a very real reality for us, at least for the short term. Um, and in talking and in, in preparing for tonight, I was having a conversation with one of our um, amazing professors in the Faculty of Education and Arts, Professor Catherine Collarborn, who's a mental health historian. And really she has had some, um, some experience in looking back and, and reflecting on how historically we've responded to these sorts of challenges in the past. And certainly what she was able to say to me is that New South Wales in particular has a really strong tradition of extra institutional care, of thinking about how we can wrap supports and resilience um, processes and programs around people for wh whether they're inside a health service or a hospital or out in the community. Um, certainly in, in historically and in the early part of this century, we were seeing some of the first um, innovative models of care for mental health um, and wellbeing uh, where people were discharged from hospital, being able to go um, home for visits or on trial leave. We saw aftercare support really emerge um, as a strength out of some early um, challenges that we faced um, in the early 1900s and really an emphasis placed of the significance of the role of families and communities um, in supporting people um, through these sorts of crises. And so you'll see as we talk here tonight that these are all the same kinds of themes that we'll draw upon, that we've actually drawn upon from our historical past and that can take us through um, this next phase. Um, and certainly it will take all of us to rally together and to support each other through COVID. So in thinking about that, we do need leaders like we've brought together um, to you tonight to think about these challenges and respond to the challenges of tomorrow. 
But first, we're going to introduce to you an emerging leader in our midst. Uh, Jake Dublin is a PhD student here at the University of Newcastle who isn't able to be here with us tonight with his apologies, but really wanted to talk a little bit more about what 2020 has meant to him from his perspective um, and how it's been being a student um, in a very, very unusual um, and somewhat historical year. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jake Jubilin and I'm a PhD student here at the University of Newcastle. I'm also a rifleman in the Army Reserves. And the year that I graduated with a Bachelor of Psychology was the same year that I deployed with the Army to conduct uh, maritime border security operations with the Navy to the north of Australia. I was aware of the physical isolation that would come with this deployment. We were gonna be spending weeks at time at sea um, with little to no contact with our family and friends back home. But what I wasn't prepared for was the mental isolation that would come with it. Given the chance to talk to your loved ones and your friends back home, which was limited in itself, you didn't really wanna talk about the things that you'd been doing, some of the things you weren't allowed to even talk about. Some of your family and friends even criticised the role that you were providing from a political perspective. The only people who you could really speak to about what you'd been doing were the people who you were serving with. And when my deployment finished um, and my full-time work with the army finished, I hadn't prepared myself very well. Uni had finished, I didn't have another job lined up and I didn't have a house to even go to. I was moving back in with my parents. I had no intention of returning back to uni and I had no idea what a PhD would entail, but for some reason I opened up an email from the University of Newcastle one day and they were offering a scholarship to conduct a PhD on the mental health of Australian Defence Force veterans. I hadn't worked in the mental health industry. I didn't have any postgraduate research or study behind me. I hadn't reached provisional registration as a psychologist, but I was a veteran and we were gonna be researching veterans. I was so nervous about my interview with my would-be supervisors that I considered pulling out at the last minute. But within five minutes of speaking with them, I realized something. Just by way of myself being a veteran, I already had a far greater understanding of the experiences of ADF personnel than they did. They had the research experience and the research knowledge and skills to build a research project, but I had that lived military experience. And to their credit, my supervisors saw that opportunity and the value that my lived experience could add to the research team and decided to give me a shot at doing my PhD. About a year into my PhD, I got told that I'd be deploying to Afghanistan. I had to defer uni for 12 months and move to Brisbane and conduct my pre-deployment training. And then I deployed to Afghanistan with the Brisbane based unit for seven months. When I returned home, I was experiencing some of those same issues that I'd experienced on my first deployment. But it's important to note that none of these issues came about because of being exposed to any trauma or any sort of extreme violence or any loss of life. What I was experiencing was a sense of isolation, a loss of purpose and a lack of direction. I was feeling physically isolated from the people I'd deployed with. They remained in Brisbane and stayed in the army full time. I was now back in New South Wales and going to uni. I felt mentally isolated from the people who I was now engaged with because I felt they weren't on the deployment with me. I didn't really want to talk to them about the things that were going on on the deployment because I didn't think they'd really understand. I was experiencing that loss of purpose and a lack of direction because for the last seven months, I'd been a rifleman, a soldier in Afghanistan, and all of a sudden I wasn't. And if I'm not that soldier in Afghanistan now, then what am I? When I returned to my studies uh, in early 2020, I was quickly deployed to help with the bushfire assistance and cleaning up in the rural areas affected by the bushfire emergency. The devastation that I'd seen on the TV was now I was seeing in real life and the physical and mental isolation of the people affected by the bushfires became obvious. The physical isolation was obvious in one bloke that we spoke to when we eventually cleared the road down to his um, isolated property. He said that he hadn't seen anyone for three weeks. The mental isolation was obvious as well. We were going door knocking on people's properties, asking if we could help or seeing if we could assist them in any way. Most people were happy to see us and would, would take up the chance to put us to work. But for some people, they'd lost so much and the devastation was so great that the sheer thought of even trying to rebuild and move on was just too much. And for the people who had lost their businesses and their houses, and sadly some of their loved ones, they were experiencing this loss of purpose and lack of direction as well. Pretty much as soon as the bushfires wrapped up, we were again deployed to enforce some of the lockdowns and the isolations due to COVID-19. It was becoming pretty clear 
that society as a whole was experiencing this sense of isolation, this lack of purpose and a lack of direction. We are physically isolated from our friends and family. We're mentally isolated because this pandemic has had its own unique individual effects on us. And people who are losing their jobs and losing their businesses are experiencing this la lack of purpose and loss of direction. And we're all living in this extreme uncertainty about the future. My research focuses, focuses on helping veterans to maintain positive mental health in uncertain times. We do this by building and maintaining a routine around positive, better, healthier lifestyles, such as fitness, nutrition, mindfulness, and sleep. The need for such a tool in greater society is fast emerging. And when we talk about looking ahead and better, healthier living, we can consider some of the statistics around the veteran studies that we've been looking at. We see ADF personnel who are trying to leave the defence force and transition to the civilian space, they often maintain positive mental health throughout that first 12 months. But when the excitement of leaving the defence force, looking for a new job and relocating and reconnecting with old friends, once that subsides, we start to see a decline in their mental health. And we should keep this in mind when us as society start to emerge from this lockdown and isolation. Let's not let the excitement of heading back to the pubs and reconnecting with our friends and going traveling, let's not let all these things mask the fact that we may be suffering from some negative mental health issues brought on by this pandemic. And to all the mental health researchers and workers, we're gonna be getting contacted by countless people over the next few months and maybe even years who are still struggling with the lasting effects of this pandemic. And so I urge you all to draw on your experiences and your struggles throughout this difficult time and try to use that lived experience to understand the population or the group of people that you're trying to support. Because much like my acceptance into the PhD program, your lived experience might be that little missing piece that allows your research team or your healthcare team to provide effective care. Thank you. And we say thank you to you, Jake, not for recording that just remarkable insight, but for all of the service and all of the work you've done to keep all of us safe um, and your counterparts at the ADF too, so thank you. It's a nice segue now into introducing to you all the rest of our panel who have joined us here this evening to add to Jake's reflections on 2020 and the hope and the optimism and the opportunities we have as we look ahead to beyond the pandemic. So I'm joined first by Professor Liz Sullivan, who's sitting here on my left. Liz is the Acting Pro Vice-Chancellor for the Faculty of Health and Medicine, and has really been instrumental in leading the Faculty of Health and Medicine's response um, to COVID-19, particularly through 2020. And you've been doing some particularly important work in readying our undergraduates to respond to COVID-19. So will you tell us a little bit about that um, and why that's been so important? Yes, thanks, Francis. And I'd just like to acknowledge Jake's uh, talk. It's so critical, the things he's talked about. Uh, so we've been looking at really uh, being able to support a surge workforce, a surge health workforce. And of course, that's quite critical because when first COVID was coming on the scene, we saw what was happening in Italy and parts, other parts of the world and the enormous stress it placed on the clinical workforce. And part of our role is the, is the next workforce. So we're the pipeline and particularly with our nursing, and with our doctors being interns, we, it was really critical that our final year students would be able to actually be able to enter the workforce in 2021. So we led a number of initiatives uh, working with both government and with the local health districts in partnership. And I'll just mention, mention a couple of those. So there was the assistance in medicine. This was a program that was uh, Jenny May and Brian, both from the faculty, were very much instrumental in working with uh, New South Wales Health and uh, other universities. And that was about really almost like a trainee intern. And so that was where the workforce was looking at final year medical students who would have a specific role. They would be assigned to a junior medical doctor and they would be able to learn the skills of being an intern so that they would be ready to join the workforce if we needed a surge in 2020 or to start as interns in 2021. There were also technical assistants, and this was a role where uh, students, health students could apply and work with the local health district, and they might be involved in supporting contact tracing and doing testing that we've all seen, and also just really doing uh, basic activities around the hospital. 
A third thing we did was we were very clear about making sure that our students were both uh, kept mentally fit but also were able to do a form of clinical placement so that they would be ready, be it both virtual, telehealth or in face-to-face. -face. And so what was developed was the embedded medical, seeing a medical student uh, program. And this is where our final year medical students are able to be assigned over a, long, over a long time period to a particular team and are able to get a clinical experience. Critically, they would have like a boot camp before that, which was a week of intensive training which allowed them to sort of get the basic skills they needed, particularly around personal protective equipment and being able to um, operate within, a, I suppose, a, a different type of circumstance that COVID-19 does in the clinical setting. We also looked at assistance in nursing as well and with our, with our final year nurses also being able to provide a surge workforce, particularly in places like nursing homes and, uh, and also the hospitals. I think lastly, we also looked at um, being able to have our clinical staff, so our clinical academics being able to actually, if needed, be available to take on from being more part-time to full-time activities within the hospital to support their other clinicians. So there's some of the initiatives, but I think critically we've had great support from our colleagues in the local health districts to allow us to be able to maintain training and clinical placements where, where possible for across all our health disciplines. And also I think for us to be able to show that we can add value and support them as they are at the front of this fight against COVID-19. It's a genuine partnership, I think, mm. where everybody has benefited and, you know, including our community members. Thanks, Liz. Yes, yeah. Thanks, Francis. I'll just um, point everybody's attention at home to the QR code, which we can see above our heads here, but hopefully is displaying on your um, computer or television screens. That's the way in which you can access our team here and ask us questions um, live. So I have a, a device here and the questions will pop up um, as you ask them at home. You just need to get your camera from your phone to take a photo of the QR code. You'll be then taken to a platform where you can enter your questions in directly um, if, if any of them come up whilst any of our experts are talking. Thank you. Um, Liz, you did mention telehealth. Um, yeah. Can you expand a little bit on the use of digital and those sorts of technologies in the context that you've just been um, speaking about? Yes, I think um, one of the unexpected, I suppose, um, good things to come out of COVID is it's really made us push on to sort of be much more digitally engaged and to look at being able to use simulation more so that our students know, get their skill sets before they are in with clinical patients. Also to look at telehealth and telehealth both from a training perspective uh, is a really critical thing but also to do service delivery. So for instance with nutrition and dietetics we now have a telehealth clinic uh, where students and staff members are able to provide dietary uh, consultations which both satisfy the students learning attributes and their experiences of being how to become clinicians but also provides for our community opportunities to talk about diet. Another example is with occupational therapy where we've been using telehealth also. So if going from previously a face-to-face -face clinic, which is I suppose the traditional clinic, to being able to start being able to do occupational therapy over using a telehealth principle. And that's really where you have uh, your patients can be on Zoom or something equivalent, so in their, in their bedroom or oh, sorry, in their house. And then uh, we are in a setting where we're able to interact and actually do a full clinical assessment. So that's been quite exciting. And I think also the training of students being able to get virtual experiences when we weren't able to have face-to-face -face clinical experiences. I think that's something for the future where we'll do a lot more of clinical placements virtually to make sure we get upskilled with basic skills before we go face-to-face. Uh, thanks, Susan. I think selfishly reflecting on, um, on some of the, the work that I do, which is bringing technology to the point of care for mental health and substance use, to have these sorts of technologies embedded in the training programs um, for health workers, um, for, for many of our, the future health workers, is really important in being able to better leverage those sorts of um, technologies once people are out in that workforce. Yeah. So it's almost taken COVID for us to make that necessary leap in a sense. I think, I think it's given us the... Um, I think the opportunity to, to try new things and to try them quickly at scale. And I think critically one of the other interesting ones when you talk about mental health is virtual ward rounds. You know, mm. medical students being able to go through virtual ward rounds, which again allows it to be, have a lot more people engaged in the process and in learning activities. Mm.
Thanks, Liz. And that kind of leads me to um, something I'd like to ask you about, uh, Rhonda. So thank you again for our acknowledgement of country. And to introduce you formally, this is Professor Rhonda Wilson, who's a professor in nursing and midwifery here in the Faculty of Health and Medicine at the University of Newcastle. So you've been doing some really interesting and important work supporting our frontline clinical staff during COVID-19, embedding sort of disaster principles and mental health principles and digital technologies into your work. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, well, we're really, really interested in um, the, the health workforce and, and I guess from a nursing perspective and with the nursing workforce as well, um, because the nurses are um, spending a lot of time with uh, COVID patients, for example, and doing testing um, at testing stations. And it's quite an anxious experience mm. for a lot of people. We um, are hearing reports uh, the Premier of Victoria is saying today, as, as indicated today, that um, the health workforce is at um, significant risk of acquiring mm. um, transmission of COVID-19. And so the health workforce is really in these very uncertain times and in the front line of COVID-19. And so it, it, is, it follows that people are going to be very anxious about that experience. And we can do a lot of training and work to support people with um, personal protective equipment. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that's very, very important. And at the same time, we want to try and keep the social distance. Um, and again, it, it links in with all of our digital technologies as well. If we can better leverage the digital technologies, then perhaps we can keep people at sufficient distance, but kind of socially close enough mm. to be able to do high quality health assessments. Um, but for, for our health staff and the anxiety and the uncertainty about whether they might bring COVID mm. home, for example, to their own families, it's been very distressing for people. In the mental health area where my expert, expertise lies, um, we, and across all of the mental health professions, we talk a lot about something called clinical supervision. It's a professional development or a way of being able to look after ourselves and make sure that um, as we do that, we can also be a therapeutic agent for others. Mm. And, uh, and being able to maintain ourselves, our self-care in order to provide care to other people in a personable way requires us to, to manage our anxiety and distress and to not put that on to others. So at the moment, we're doing some research to look at how we might be able to develop, to take from some of those knowledges about mental health and mental health nursing and how we care for ourselves and retain our therapeutic agency to give to our, um, the people we look after, mm. our patients, our clients, the consumers, and we want to be able to share that with our frontline nursing colleagues in the first instance to um, be able to support them with some um, clinical supervision, some professional development. And of course, we want to be able to do that in a way that um, allows them to, uh, it's convenient for them to access, um, they can access it at a point of need, and so it naturally follows that a digital platform of some type is the most suitable way to try and, uh, and, and provide that support. So at the moment, we're piloting a new intervention mm. to support um, particularly nursing. But as we go forward, um, we're hoping to be able to, to do that for other parts of the health professions as well, so that people will not only have uh, in their workplaces, the appropriate resources in terms of, of their um, uh, protective equipment, but also they'll be emotionally protected as well as we, as we try and provide some surge support, I suppose, mm. as well, to borrow Liz's word, um, to, to support the workforce as we deal with these very uncertain times. It is really important, isn't it, that building resilience and those protective factors, because I think we'll be in this in this state for, for quite some, some time. time. 
Um, so apologies to people at home. It sounds like we've had a spaceship land in the other room, so I'm not sure if that's coming through or not um, on the audio at home. Um, but bear with us, um, and I hope you can still hear us OK. Um, and just a reminder to keep um, sending your questions through to us mm -hmm. using the QR code that hopefully you'll be able to see on your screen. Um, Rhonda, it's, that's really critically important work and I, I do love the way that the digital platform can enable mm -hmm. those resources and tools to be there whenever the person is um, ready and has the time or the space to interact with them. It does open up that flexibility, doesn't it? Yeah. It really does open up a great deal of flexibility and I think that we're, we're, we're in mental health in particular, we've been using digital platforms around the world for some time to administer um, digital interventions to support people with mental health conditions, particularly with anxiety and depression. We've got some very advanced work around the world in, in that area at the moment. And I think this uh, COVID-19 gives us an opportunity to think about that um, in many more shapes and forms. And I think as we do that, we start to think about the other um, health professions that might be able to enhance some of that work and so some of the work that we are embarking on at the moment is starting to include infection prevention and control mm. expertise and also disaster health and as we start to bring these um, areas these kind of siloed sometimes in health mm. professions areas together in unique ways we find that new knowledges can emerge and new interventions can emerge and so as a researcher, that's very, very exciting. So to draw together infection um, prevention and control, my, my area again is mental health. Yes, yes. And so I, you know, I'm a registered nurse, so I am very interested in infection control. It's the bread, the, um, bread and butter of nursing, really. Um, uh, good hand hygiene. And, you know, we, we're always talking about those infection prevention but I didn't ever see myself working very closely as a researcher with infection prevention and control. So there is a new angle to explore. How can we support people better as we bring these ideas together, as we bring disaster health into that as well? And some of those pr principles about preparation for uncertainty and managing a whole pandemic, a whole response mm around how do, we, how do we manage this and come in um, together. I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice all of a sudden. I think that <laughs> spaceship is... <laughs> indeed, indeed. It's longer than a 10 second countdown <laughs> to lift off, isn't it? Mm. Um, it is really, really important. And in, in, Thank you. In, in talking to you before tonight, mm. um, I'm also remembering speaking to you about your experience working with Aboriginal communities who've yes. also been benefiting from some of the digital approaches, but have had somewhat of a different experience in well, response to COVID. Yes, and I think this is very, very interesting news indeed. I think um, what we've seen in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in Australia in relation to COVID-19, it gives us an opportunity to think about some of the strengths of uh, First Nations peoples so one of the, the ways of, of um, knowing in Indigenous cultures is, is very oral narratives, storytelling. Mm. And stories are, are passed in families and communities and mobs. And one of the memories and one of the stories that a colleague was reminding me of recently was that there is a memory that Aboriginal people have of how um, of what happened with the Spanish flu um, in the beginning of the last century. And so those stories have come forward in families now. And of course, some of the memories were really quite horrific. The way that Aboriginal people were treated in that time were really quite horrific. And so there is a memory. People don't want to walk down that, travel down that, that road again. And so when a pandemic, something like a Spanish flu, mm. came along again in the form of COVID-19, we were very, very fast as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia to respond in a way 
that put a ring around our most vulnerable. We cared for our elders and our vulnerable people. And a lot of that narrative came through uh, in social media, for example. Mm. Um, we are getting uh, so we, we're aware that Facebook in particular has been particularly useful in passing on the, the story and the caution of we've got to look after it particularly our elders. Mm. And so everybody came together and, and physically distanced, mm -hmm. but, but came together um, socially in order to be able to provide for those needs. So it's given us an opportunity to reflect and, and think about this from a health promotion perspective, which is really interesting because if Aboriginal communities can um, manage in such a way, in such a rapid deployment of um, a health promotion strategy that is self-determined, then there is probably some very good mm -hmm. knowledge that we can draw forward to the whole dominant population to say, here's some strengths about health promotion that we can draw forward. And if applied to the whole population, would it be a good thing? Would mm. it strengthen our approach? So we're interested to understand the social media stories around health promotion around the country. And interestingly, uh, and I'm, I'm afraid I didn't get a chance to check the statistics um, today, but the last time I checked the statistics uh, for Australia, the epidemiology, the statistics in Australia, we had no Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander death related to COVID mm. at, um, in, in the last, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back a last couple of, of days and we've had nobody in ICU. Now that's an extraordinary, extraordinary. statistic and we are absolutely um, underrepresented in the best, best way. possible way. So it gives an opportunity for us to amplify a narrative of strength in Aboriginal and Torres Strait yes. Islander um, communities at the moment. My word it does, mm. thank you Rhonda. I'd like to throw now to Dr. Hazel Dalton, who's joining us virtually uh, from the Centre for Rural and Remote Ment Mental Health, where she, that's out at Orange in New South Wales, where she's the research director out there. Um, so Hazel, I guess um, thinking about Rhonda's reflection on Aboriginal communities has gotten me thinking a little bit more broadly about our rural, remote um, and regional Aussies out there. Um, and how that strength of community um, in Indigenous communities has really protected them from, from COVID-19 and some of the impacts that the rest of us are feeling. Um, is this also true in terms of what you've been seeing in your context um, in the rural and remote areas, particularly of New South Wales? Um, thanks, Francis. So I guess from our perspective, we have the benefit of distance and thin populations, which is somewhat protecting us from the challenges. Uh, I would certainly think that community strength and cohesiveness has helped with adherence and, and really pretty positive behaviour. One, one of the worries we have, I guess, is we've, we've had a boon in domestic tourism, so that, that poses its own challenges in terms of will there be infections from, you know, Sydney ciders coming up over the mountains and things like that for me in Orange or in other places. So there is that aspect, but I, I think from a community perspective, it's been pretty strong. But for us, it's actually um, at the back of, you know, a whole series of adversities. And so in some respects, rural and remote communities are, are pretty prepared for dealing with hard things and getting on with it would probably be one, one of the comments I'd make. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll throw it back to you, Francis. Um, thank you very much. I'm just making sure that um, you can hear us again. Um, it, it almost looks like you're sitting in the spaceship that um, was landing um, here, which um, I'm glad that stopped now. But um, Hazel, you, you, you do say, you did mention that, um, that rural adversity, I guess, for one of another way of, of describing the experience is, is not all that uncommon. Um, for people in rural and remote areas. And you touched on bushfires and floods in addition to, to COVID. Um, and, it, and then that need to sort of protect the community at the same time you want to encourage people becoming to the community. 
Um, there's been lots of different roles and different ways in which people um, in rural and remote areas have been able to embrace or, or otherwise their roles. Um, has, there, has digital technologies assisted with that in your areas? What, what, what are you hearing from the rural mental health workers, particularly um, that, that you work with and, and some of the initiatives that have come out of your centre or that have been supported by your centre in, in the face of 2020? Sure. I guess one of the things I would state would be for us, we we look at, you know, this sort of disaster response in the lens of rural adversity because they tend to be experienced not in isolation as these really discrete events, but as more of a continuum. So we've come off the back of uh, quite a long and extensive drought. It's not over. And then we've had the unprecedented bushfires. Some places have had flooding. And as we said, we're dealing with COVID right now. So from our perspective, that's the lens in which we look. And we run uh, the Rural Adversity Mental Health Program here from the centre, and that's in partnership with rural local health districts. So we've got 20 staff out in the field who do this sort of uh, disaster preparedness work, disaster response work. They train uh, community members in mental health literacy and this kind of work as well as community development work. So they're embedded in their communities. And so I guess one of the big challenges for them is in the time of COVID when you've got physical distancing and the inability to get out that they're unable to do the work as they would normally do. So we've been really grateful that the centre has a strong comms and social media presence. And so that ramp has been able to connect with its communities virtually. And we've also had to uh, adapt the training so it's now online and we can do that in a still an engaged way because it goes via Zoom. It's not self-directed, but we can connect with our communities and targets that way. And I guess one of my reflections on things is given the, for our RAMP coordinators, coordinators who are normally out in the field, they actually really struggled with this changeover. It was an initial break that had a very long season of dealing with bushfires and drought and things like that. But after that initial break, they're extroverts, they're independent people, and they don't like sitting idly by. So that was a real challenge from a mental health perspective was looking after those workers and keeping them connected, keeping them engaged, having some virtual morning teas and catching up, you know, as a, as a general group to keep connected, things like that. Interesting you say yeah. that because um, it is true that some of our natural ways of being in the world or our personality traits for one way, another way of describing, um, describing the way we are in the world can either work for us or against us in a range of situations. And, um, you know, that transition to working from home and then that transition back again um, has probably been a bit of a challenge um, for me and I think for, for people around us. And I wonder if that's also been the case from your perspective, um, Hazel. Uh, definitely. I, I think it was really interesting The here at the centre, we were able to switch to working from home rather quickly and it was done very smoothly. We'd been using Zoom quite a lot before this because we serve rural and remote communities, so we can't always get to everywhere we want to go. And so we all picked up tools, got home and worked really well. But when it was time to come back to the office, I, I found that some of the staff that were struggling most to go struggled most to come back. So the transitions were difficult. And it has, hasn't, it's thrown up a whole pile of, sort of challenges for the group to think about how best to manage that and how best to keep connected. You know, are you home because this is best for you or are you feeling having anxiety in the transition back phase? So that's, that's been an ongoing thing for us, but I think it's done really well. Yes, I think it'll continue to be uh, a bit of a tension, I think, as we might have to move into and out of those sorts sort of working from home or other arrangements. And, and I'm wondering, um, Adrian, I'll introduce you now properly, um, Professor Adrian Dunlop, who is a conjoint um, researcher associated with the University of Newcastle, but also is the clinical director of our drug and alcohol services here in the Hunter New England local health district. So when you're managing a clinical service, um, and you're, you're um, you know, through this type of pandemic. Um, what has been your experience and how have you transitioned in or, or, um, or pivoted to support this changing work environment and potentially, a, um, I guess, an increased or has there been an increased clinical need for your services during this time? Yeah, thanks, Francis. Um, so I think from the start, um, it's important to acknowledge that we're part of a much larger healthcare system and um, we have very good uh, infection control advice, uh, very good public health advice, uh, and that's been uh, present you know, since um, 
that date in March that I can hardly forget mm. now. Um, so, so that's that's been a really important part of it to have that um, good support and advice, uh, and to know where to go to to get additional advice for our health staff working with uh, the community. You know, really from the outset, and I think places us in uh, a, has placed us and will continue to place us in a good position uh, if we do see uh, more spread throughout our Hunter New England area. So I have to say that to start, particularly, um, uh, I guess a couple of issues of patients who have drug and alcohol problems and present to, to healthcare. Um, so one of the things uh, that's a little bit different that, that I think wasn't seen as much with other healthcare services is we didn't really see a drop off in presentations. So not to emergency departments um, and not to people formally presenting for drug and alcohol treatment. Um, you were making the, the case before with mental health, and it's uh, additionally true for drug and alcohol, that uh, people tend not to present to services. Um, there's a lot of stigma, there's a lot of shame, there's a lot of embarrassment about having uh, any sort of substance use problem. Uh, and unfortunately, that translates into people uh, generally not presenting to services, or if they do present to services, uh, leaving a long period of time, uh, mm. you know, when uh, and, and unfortunately, things can get a lot worse uh, in, in that time uh, before they do present and formally ask for help or you know some sort of assistance. So that's a, that was a problem before the pandemic, and the pandemic hasn't made it any better. Um, we don't really understand yet other impacts of, of substance use during the pandemic because we don't have uh, really good, high-quality data that maps those sorts of changes. Um, especially even at a local level uh, over that time. But um, suffice to say, I think what we tried to do really from the outset was to make sure that we could provide as much access as we can. So we tried to make, tried to make our services more accessible. Um, so that was particularly uh, important at the MARTA Hospital where there's now a daily clinic that's very accessible for patients referred from GPs. Um, uh, and the capacity for that service to see patients increased um, quite significantly. But then also across the district, um, the different sorts of services that we run, we've tried to make sure that they remain accessible and available uh, and have done so sort of since the word go. Um, we've also thought, and this is part of the sort of influence and, and support from, from people in infection control and public health, uh, of trying to have isolated teams that um, there's not too much staff crossover. So if we had one team where there was a need to isolate staff for a period of time, that wouldn't knock out a third or a quarter of our service, but that we could have a backup team that could go and replace them. And um, so where it's suitable, we've had people working from home. Uh, we've had, um, and we've shifted largely, not entirely, but largely to telehealth consultations. So. Most of our staff are doing telephone or, or video consultations now. There's some negative aspects uh, to that. So there are some patients, I was saying to you before, um, when, when people are ambivalent about presenting or asking for help or find it really hard to ask for help, you could imagine that making that leap to go and see somebody might be even more difficult if it's to a video camera, not to a, a person sitting in a room. So um, that's a challenge and in, in some parts of our service we try to make sure that that option remains to see um, see somebody face to face. Um, so they're the things we've, we've sort of done from the start. Um, we have had um, training uh, in, in some of our, some parts of our district to provide um, or to do nasal swabs for patients who might find it difficult to present to uh, one of the hospital clinics or one of the university clinic or another clinic to get testing. So uh, we make it easy for people to get um, testing because that's clearly uh, an important message throughout the pandemic. If you think you've got a symptom, go and get tested mm. early in the piece, not, not late in the piece. So yeah, there's a mix of things I think we've been doing from the, from the start. Um, but it's exhausting for healthcare staff. Mm. There's no doubt about that. And, uh, uh, and we don't really know how far we are into uh, the pandemic. Uh, we're all really hopeful for uh, a vaccine or more effective treatments, but we, who knows when that's going to arrive. Uh, indeed. It's, um, so we had a question, a few questions come through um, from people who are joining us um, from, it's, uh, maybe it's home, maybe it's somewhere else, um, which, which I think I might bring in mm. here just for a moment sure. because 
Um, the comment is that um, it's health and related professionals um, have we been gratified by the increased recognition of the importance of public health and medical roles that has come through COVID. But I wonder if particularly there's an opportunity for us to influence the conversation around help seeking when you're feeling um, mentally um, unwell or mentally um, threatened or, or in trouble and, and, and to encourage people to access the alcohol and other drug use services that we do have available before it's a long way down the path in their experience. So uh, uh, maybe that's a yes mm. from you, um, yeah, Adrian, but I can see Sarah talking in the background as well. Mm. So I might quickly introduce Sarah Bartlett from EveryMind, who's joining us here today um, representing EveryMind, who's a national organisation associated with the Hunter New England Local Health District, mm. but who also does a lot of work with the MindFrame project, which is about how do we talk safely um, and encouragingly mm. about mental health, about suicide prevention and about drug and alcohol use in the media and in open outlets. Mm. And maybe you both might like to comment sure. um, in response to that particular question. Yeah, no, thanks, Francis. I think it's a really good point. Um, more so than ever, we need to be able to encourage our communities to feel prepared and able to have a conversation with a loved one, with a partner, with a colleague or with, with anybody in the community around help seeking, but we need to understand the risks around certain types of conversations and particularly language. Language is so important. Words matter. Um, we have the MindFrame guidelines that really outline the importance of safe language when we're talking about drug and alcohol, mental ill health and suicide. So we really need to provide literacy and understanding to our community so that they can feel informed about these issues, but also feel able to have a conversation and that means linking people up to help when they need it. Being able to provide time and a, and a safe, sensitive space to really have a safe conversation, um, to be uh, a listener, a non-judgmental li listener and providing someone with a help pathway. Um, and it's also really important in the media at the moment. Um, sadly, you know, our Australian communities have just been inundated with very distressing news coverage from the drought, from the bushfires, from COVID. And you know, that's the media's role. They have a public interest in telling the story of the day, what is happening. So we need to be able to ensure whenever we're providing uh, a news stories to this effect that there's always help seeking information available for vulnerable audiences, whether that be um, the lifeline number, suicide callback service, or the um, 1800 alcohol and other drugs hotline. People need to know where support is available for them. They certainly, um, they certainly do, Sarah, and if people stay till the end, we'll be able to provide um, some very practical tips um, and op options <coughs> for people to um, source and, and access that type of support from. Um, so I wonder if now that the spotlight is on um, mental health and medical responses to COVID-19, um, whether we um, can actually control that conversation a bit more away from, for example, in the, in the media about se drug seizures and drug yeah. busts towards we have an increased demand for our, our services, let's put um, effort and time into reducing the demand um, for alcohol and other drugs and encouraging people to mm. seek treatment early. Yeah, and I think it's about providing our communities with an understanding of what treatment looks like. So that's um, obviously going back to where we started, mm. the voice of lived experience and being able to share those perspectives. Obviously treatment's going to look different for everybody, but being able to share with our broader community how people got through difficult times, what help they sought, what that looked like for them and how they've come out the other side and are now obviously back to feeling like they're living fruitful and productive lives. Mm. And that treatment is the pathway yeah, to that. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We've had another question come through and it's actually been on my mind particularly this week and, and does come under the banner of, of, I guess, safe conversations and how we encourage those um, with the, the community at large. Um, so somebody's asked what we might advise when we share with our children as mm -hmm. how to handle the uncertainties that we faced, particularly in the last six months, and that we could be dealing with this um, indefinitely. Um, you've got any thoughts on that particularly, um, maybe Sarah to start with and then I'll throw yeah. to the panel. Um, Look, I think first and foremost, there are so many amazing um, youth focused organisations in Australia. So we've got Kids Helpline, Lifeline, um, uh, sorry, Headspace and Reach Out that have a whole range of tools and resources available for parents to help shape those conversations. 
um, that would probably be better placed than someone like myself. Um, but I would be encouraging um, parents and community members to seek out that support. Um, and you can actually access the full range of um, support services if you go onto Life in Mind, um, the suicide prevention portal. It's got a link to all of those services for people at home. Mm. Thanks, Zara. Uh, would the panel like to weigh in at all on any um, helpful tips before um, I offer my two cents worth about how I've had these kinds of conversations with my kids at home? Sure, yeah. I think um, connection is, is mm. clearly really important, yeah. uh, Francis. Um, feeling connected uh, to others and reaching out and continuing that connection um, throughout this uh, long period. I've got a lot of family in Melbourne. Mm. Uh, it's been particularly challenging for people in Victoria and Melbourne, um, you know, really since the start of the pandemic, but especially more recently. So uh, we can't have the same face-to-face -face contact that we might have once, but, um, you know, trying to continue to have conversations on the phone or, um, you know, using one of the social media platforms or, or whatever is, is important. and. Um, mm trying to reach out and remain connected is really a, a big indicator of how people cope and how people survive. Mm. I agree with that as well. I think connection and I think some of the stuff earlier said too about maybe routine sort of act and connections where there maybe might be an activity where you're allowed to do it. So some sort of um, physical activity, sleep, Mm. Uh, and also um, different types of connection. And I think also even, I've got older children, I think it's also keeping in contact to sort of, not so much an are you okay, but really an are you okay type of conversation. What have you done today? Oh yeah. And because I think one of the things uh, is that people who are working have either often been really having intense work or having much less work. Mm. And the isolation of being at home for sort of six months compared mm. to being in it, a, a work environment where you get all your sort of interactions, I think has been incredibly um, distressing and disruptive for people. And so that connection with phone calls, Zoom, whatever, face-to-face uh, -face really makes a massive difference, but it needs to be constant. Mm. And I think it, it's, I agree with all, all that the panel was saying, absolutely, but I think it's okay to, to be honest with children yeah. mm -hmm. and say, yeah. I feel a bit uncomfortable about this as well. And, and in doing so, build a narrative yeah. around coping and resilience yep. and being able to, to draw in a strength and agency in order to, to get through all the practical things. So important to look back on a day and find something that you can look back on and say, that felt really satisfying. I did that really well. That was a really nice experience. Yeah. It might just be a small thing and that's okay, but it's having those things that you can reflect back on and be satisfied with and draw the strength from that that helps to carry forward to build the resilience to cope. And I think that's a really important message for parents out there who are working with children who, um, you know, what was good about today? Mm. And try and build a strengths narrative into the family conversation. I think that's really important, mm. um, absolutely. Um, one of the uh, other questions that's come through has been a little bit of a contrast to the, the sort of conversation we're having, but that um, somebody's commented that their mental health actually improved a little during lockdown um, <laughs> as they felt like they'd been given permission to slow down mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe I might go mm -hmm. to Hazel first. Um, to see whether she, she has any reflection on that or, or maybe commenting on the role that the busyness of modern life might have um, on poor mental health or, or whether that might also be true. Is that the real remote way, way of life potentially is to, to slow things down and, um, um, and tolerate some of the ambiguity and uncertainty in response to what we're seeing? Thanks, Francis. I actually have a short comment from the previous discussion, uh, certainly in our house, spending a little bit more time, deliberate time with your children is really helpful just to give them the space to come back and connect with you and let things emerge from them so you can provide support. And for me, it means a little bit less sleep because of the younger party. But um, the other thing in terms of linking to resources for that would be emerging minds for children as opposed to young adults, they have excellent resources if anyone look, wants to have more concrete tips and tricks. 
But with respect to improving, you know, being good for our mental health, I, I certainly found the lockdown provided a much better opportunity for physical exercise. I don't know if we're so um, idle in the country, but maybe more um, cognizant of things out of our control. Certainly hasn't been less busy for me during this time, but it's just been different. And a bit like, oh, um, it's not the same thing at all, but you know, farmers during drought, their workload often increases, you know, things go up to feeding animals and this and the other. So it's not so much that you find yourself idle, you just find yourself adapting to different things and putting in different strategies. And I guess one of the other things is then really reaching out to that support Understanding that your community is in the same boat is really helpful and making sure that you're helping others because as soon as you're helping others, it certainly makes it easier on yourself. It takes the lens off, allows you to be of use and that certainly is actually useful to yourself as well. My, my comments. Hazel, I do really take your point about um, about slowing down um, and the the important impact that that might be able to have um, on our kids, um, no matter how old they are, and just taking that little bit of extra time to talk with them about their feelings and their views on what's happening because they don't miss much these days. Um, and if their little minds are left to their own devices to make sense of what's happening, then maybe they can get caught up in some different ways of thinking about the world than the ones we might want to to help them develop. So I think helping them talk their feelings out loud, I think reflecting on um, the, the good things that have happened during the day, um, as opposed to the distresses and worries um, that we might be um, having in our, in, our, in our front of mind. And then as you say, taking the time um, to, to connect are all really, really important um, things that also sound really easy to do as we're all sitting here um, in a lounge away from our families at the moment. Um, but I think, you know, reminds us all about the importance of doing just those basic, um, somewhat basic things um, in the face of COVID. We've also heard, um, uh, had a question come through about um, the person said some wonderful assessments of the challenges COVID-19 has presented for our human minds. Um, and just wondering if the panel can contact, uh, comment on um, how we might be leaders during these um, ambiguous and uncertain times and what we might do to support our teams um, as leaders um, during such a time. So as a clinical leader of a clinical service, Adrian, I might throw to you first um, and get you to, to talk to us about um, the approach that you've taken. Sure, so thanks, uh, Francis. So probably the most important thing that just immediately springs to mind is that this is really a very chronic anxiety provoking period of time that gets better and worse depending on different uh, announcements and different statistics and different things that are put forward. Uh, but it's, it's uh, a, a long period of raised anxiety for a whole lot of people. Some people it really affects actually, but, but all of us it affects. Um, so probably the most important thing in terms of leadership is to recognise that and to try even harder to make sure that um, your staff work well with each other and uh, recognise people get stressed and it is distressing and to try to look after each other. That's the mm. most important thing I think we can do. And a concept that comes to my mind is the concept of psychological safety. So we might not be able to um, protect physical safety so much, or we, we do, but it's maybe that's a little more out of our control. But maybe if we can create an environment where people feel like they can they can talk without fear of getting um, ridiculed or um, in trouble, or, or um, you know, or um, they're being stigma associated with what they're saying um, in that workplace, then that that might be something that we can do um, and encourage. That certainly sounds like the approach you've taken. Hazel, you moved your microphone down to your mouth. Is there something you'd like to, to add in terms of leading teams um, through COVID-19 and, and I guess ongoing adversity? I think one of the things you said to me earlier on um, before we started tonight was that um, perhaps uh, the bigger cities are getting a bit of an insight into what it's actually like to live um, in that rural and remote environment um, of, of constant um, threat or, uh, or, or exposure to different droughts and floods and other adversities. Um, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Oh, certainly in terms of, uh, yeah, th that's my reflection is think is that cities finally having that sense of what it's like to live with uncertainty, although this is, it's completely uncertain for us as well. Uh, tremendously difficult time when you look at decisions being 
made or not made re regarding the economy and what we can depend on, what we can plan for, you know, so it's challenging on all fronts. I think in terms of, yeah, that sort of adversity frame and being used to uncertainty, it really is about, you know, it's it's interesting to talk about preparedness when you're in the middle of a disaster, but preparedness is one of the things, is all the safety that you can put in place. But preparedness for the next one starts whilst you're in the current disaster, because partly what you're doing is responding. And um, as Adrian said, you know, it's uncertain, it's going up and down, and so your responses are varying. But as you get to come to grips with it and we respond and adapt to the new conditions, we then learn from the previous situation what we will do differently. Now, some of those things are very structural and large, like policy things, how we manage our water, what we do in terms of you know, economic recovery and things like that. But other things are small and in terms of you know, your individual, your family, your community adaptations as well. So there's a real opportunity to learn and grow in these, in these difficult times. The challenge sometimes comes when there's back to back to back and you're in constant response mode and how do you recover from one when you're dealing with the next and and that poses an ongoing challenge for, for us to to work with but in some respects some some adaptations have cross protection I would guess you know good self-care good family care good planning um, and unfortunately sometimes all the planning doesn't help with things that you can't imagine coming your way. Oh. Indeed, and I think um, so. What people are seeing at home now is a slide that really lists some of the ways in which um, our group here has has rallied together and launched new tools and resources to support mental health and well-being um, of Australians. Um, and so, I'd really encourage you to access the range of support programs and online tools that you can see listed there. Um, it, to move, I guess, from that almost disaster and acute phase and into thinking about coping and building resilience um, as we move out of that acute phase. Um, so thanks to everybody here for providing access to those types of resources. Mm -hmm. And I'll just particularly draw people's attention to the Breathing Space community on the slide there, which is a social network um, that we've set up especially for um, Australian community members who want to connect with others and share experiences and ask questions um, of experts and I guess keep the conversation that we've had here going a little bit um, after we finish tonight because unfortunately we are at the end of our time together. I could talk about um, these issues um, and potential solutions and, and, and opportunities with this wonderful panel all night, but uh, unfortunately I can't. Um, maybe my kids at home are jumping up and down with my hubby and, um, and saying, great, mum will be home soon. But um, thank you very much for, for your time, for your thoughtfulness, mm -hmm. and for all the hard work and effort that you've been putting into strengthening our community um, and supporting our, 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 our community in response to COVID. 19 um, and beyond. I know we've talked a lot about challenges tonight, but we do actually have a lot of a lot of resources and a lot of effort going into helping us through that next phase. And so um, as I wrap up, I'll just draw people's attention at home to some of these um, more general tips and advice for safeguarding and protecting our own mental health mm -hmm. and well-being and resilience. And certainly these are the types of things that we can start talking about with our families and our friends. Um, if and when we need to. So it might look like a bit of common sense up there um, and hopefully it is common sense mm -hmm. in the fact that we're all doing these sorts of things, but it might be a timely reminder that we don't forget to do some of these simple things. And if we can string those together, uh, we can put ourselves um, in a better a place for our mental health and wellbeing. So thank you so much all for your time and your effort and your thoughts tonight and for sharing those with us. Thank you all for joining us at home. Um, or from wherever you're joining us uh, from. And we hope that you've enjoyed being part of this conversation as much as I have enjoyed participating in it. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to our next uh, lecture in the Looking Ahead series, which will be on Tuesday, the 22nd of September, and will focus on climate change in challenging times. Um, and I think one of our questions um, from one of our, um, our community members brought to the panel tonight um, alluded to some of the positive impacts potentially mm. that COVID-19 might have had um, maybe for, for their mental health and wellbeing, but some of the opportunities to slow down a bit and, and take the business out of our lives. And certainly, I'm sure we've all seen, as I have, some of those um, 
images from around the world of mm. the um, beautiful impact that uh, reducing that busyness um, and that external um, activity has had on some of our most beautiful environments um, around the world. So Professor Paul Dastour will be leading us through that next um, lecture in just over a month's time, or just under a month's time, I think, um, and talking to us about climate change in those challenging times. So I hope you'll join us all then. Um, please go out there into the world um, and take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Thank you again for joining us tonight and we look forward to seeing you for lecture three in our series. Thank you very much and good night.
Thank <laughs> you.